Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EOL seminar series. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Lawson, who is no stranger to NCAR, where he has been a scientist and visiting scientist. Dr. Lawson completed his master's and PhD in atmospheric science at the University of Wyoming. He is also a pilot certified to fly gliders and the Learjet. This has allowed him to participate in a host of NASA and NSF funded atmospheric field campaigns, either as a pilot, a scientist, or both. With his field experience from the perspective of both a scientist and a pilot, Paul founded SPEC Incorporated, which stands for Stratton Park Engineering Company, which is based here out of Boulder. Their mission is to further our understanding of atmospheric processes and climate change, primarily through the development of innovative instrumentation. Surprise, surprise, they have their own Learjet equipped with atmospheric sensors that have participated in major field campaigns. One such field campaign is the NSF-funded SPICUL project, and SPICUL is the acronym for Secondary Production of Ice in Cumulus Experiment, in which Dr. Lawson was one of the PIs. SPICUL involved atmospheric sensors on both NCARS G5 and SPECS Learjet, measuring all kinds of cloud microphysics parameters. We are fortunate that he is here today to talk about results from the SPICUL project, which took place in May and June of 2021, and probably other field campaigns as well. For those of you watching online, we're using Slido that you can type the questions at any time. We're going to save them until the end of the talk, where we have a Q&A session. Dr. Lawson, welcome to NCAR and EOL and, N and M cubed, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Jackie, for that um, probably over-the-top introduction, but you know, I'll take it. I'll take it for sure. Um, so the slide on the viewer right now shows the two aircraft that were involved in the, the Spicule project, the NCAR G5 and the Spec Learjet. And over to the right, we were fortunate enough to um, get a BAMS cover on the project, and it's supposed to be what it's going to look like. They're backed up, and it's not going to show up until maybe late fall or winter. There's an online version of the article already. OK, so my roadmap. It'll be an introduction to the field campaign and, and, the, and the participants begin with, yeah, okay, and a general background of six mechanisms of secondary ice production, which we'll be calling SIP, and this is from a paper by Koroleff and Leisner, which um, is a very, very complete documentation of not only the, the six mechanisms, but a lot of the um, physics and thermodynamics that are associated with it. It's a great read. And then there are three of those mechanisms which we'll discuss, and just briefly, not a lot of detail. Actually, the third one we'll go into detail with. It's the one that the project focused on, um, which is the fragmented frozen drop SIP mechanism. And we'll show preliminary results from Spicuo and recent field campaigns. And the results uh, are still just preliminary. I don't know if they ever are not preliminary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the kudos to the, to the co-PIs, one of them here today, Andy, glad to see you, and Paul DeMott from uh, CSU, and of course the NCAR support staff, who just did a tremendous job uh, pulling this off during the COVID project, COVID, <laughs> what was it, pandemic. Um, and this is the first project actually that was conducted uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, and it was conducted with, with no COVID cases. So there was a lot of precautions taken with KN95 masks and so forth and distancing, but it worked out. And Carrie Wolf directed all this, uh, did a marvelous job. I'm just going to go down through this quickly. Uh, David Lorac out of the University of Northern Colorado did the forecasting. And anybody who you know, tuned in on the forecast, 
definitely learned something about forecasting. It was amazing. He was able to, you know, target clouds um, within a couple hundred nautical miles or so, and cloud-based temperatures and you know development and everything, you know, very accurately. It's amazing using ensemble models and so forth. And uh, Jan Jensen and Carrie Wolf and Corey Wolf and, and Julie Haggerty did, were the mission scientists on the G5. Rulof Bruenches flew every flight as mission scientists on the Lear. Um, Rulof is at NCAR. And Alexei Korolev uh, donated a, a radar, a KA band radar, up down looking radar on the Learjet, which is the first time we've been able to use something like that. It turned out to be very, very useful, in my opinion. And of course, I have to acknowledge the, uh, the pilots for both the G5 and the Lear, um, the ground support that kept, you know, kept the aircraft running in, in good, good shape. Uh, there were a number of postdocs and graduate students that participated and more. But I think uh, probably covered most of it here. Uh, it was a very successful project. So these are the two aircraft. OK. Use the pointer. Uh, the Learjet and G5, uh, and the instrumentation on the wings on both aircraft. I don't expect you to know all these instruments, but uh, there were a lot of microphysical cloud probes on both, pro on both aircraft that were the same. Um, and there was air motion sensing on both aircraft. The G5, in addition to the Lear, being much larger and uh, having more equipment, also measured uh, aerosols and uh, Paul DeMott's ice nucleating particle uh, instrumentation. So let's see here. Just to give you an idea of where the aircraft flew, all the way from South Dakota down to northern Texas, out to western Missouri, and it was all coordinated. You'll see that most all of these flight tracks were the do the little uh, donuts and circles and figure eights and so forth are overlapping, green and red. And the green is the Learjet, and the red is the, the G5 in this case. So basically, I borrowed this from uh, Ryan Patnoud, who is one of Paul DeMott's uh, graduate students. And the Learjet, excuse me, the G5 started out flying below cloud base, doing mapping of aerosols <clears throat> and INPs. Um, it did this pretty extensively, because some of the instruments take long sampling times. And then it would climb to 1,000 feet above cloud base and measure the droplet distribution, which is key in this uh, project, getting a measurement of droplet distribution after the, most of the CCN have activated. Then it would cl continue to climb up in the cloud as long as, as it was being worked. The Learjet started at colder temperatures, uh, attempting to map the development of coalescence in the cloud. This is the development of large drops from drops hitting each other in the cloud and, and coalescing. And then it would develop the, it would uh, document the ice phase as well. So I'm going to go through some of these slides pretty fast, and I'll slow down for the ones that I think um, need more explanation. Um, this is just giving you an idea what the clouds look like. This is out of the uh, starboard window of the Learjet. And we're trying to hit these individual turrets, although you notice in cumulus congestus, they aren't necessarily totally isolated. Uh, we try to, try to hit them, and the Learjet would always go near cloud top as much as possible. So it would like to see a top that was rising, you know, through the zero degree or minus five degree level and then, and then follow it up as it got taller and taller. And this is just for sort of an inform informative view. This is the Learjet after it's making a 45 degree climbing turn um, in a 40, 45 degree bank, excuse me, climbing turn, and that's what the pilot looks at when he's, when he's you know, trying to maneuver. So this was, I think, maybe the first or one of the first projects where the G5 was doing this kind of, uh, of research, where it was in coordination with another aircraft, and it was flying through these 
vigorous cumulus clouds. So it was an experience for uh, a number of people on the G5. Um, I remember hearing that the, uh, the radar on the G5 at one time lost a number of its raid disks from the turbulence. So um, they, they had fun. Okay, a brief primer. Now I've borrowed some slides and uh, modified them a little bit from, from Alexei Korolev, who gave a presentation at the 2023 AMS uh, annual meeting in January of this year. Um, and it was really a, a, a great documentation of secondary ice production of SIP. So if you see a little coral off up on the upper right, that means some of that slide or all that slide was, was his. Okay, so there's one. So Alexi talks about, you know, the three um, mechanisms for ice formation in clouds, homogeneous ice nucleation, most of you are familiar with, you know, at very, very cold temperatures, supercooled water drops will freeze without any uh, stimulation. Heterogeneous ice nucleation, that's when supercooled drops are uh, impacted or contain a uh, ice nucleating particle, an INP, and it stimulates them or catalyzes them to freeze. And then there's secondary ice production, um, which subject with this, which just happens, as shown down here, after primary ice production, after PIP. After PIP, we get SIP. And there are six mechanisms, which I think show up on the next slide. Now, a couple slides down the road. But there are various mechanisms for the formation of secondary ice. This is just showing from Alexi's presentation all the different projects that have involved uh, secondary ice production over just the last five years. So I was just astonished to see that many projects. And the red dots here are in situ measurements, and the, the yellow dots are remote measurements of SIP. So yeah, I didn't put that in there to study. OK, now the six mechanisms of SIP. Here's the one that we're going to focus on um, in this presentation, and droplet fragmentation during freezing or as it'll be called later, fragmented frozen drops, FFD. Uh, Supercooled drop freezes, basically breaks up, okay? There's a lot of ways it can break up, which we'll even show some of that. Next is the, the hollet mosset mechanism, which is you know, very well known in the literature for about the last 60 years. It's used uh, in almost all the um, numerical simulations these days, whether it's warranted or not. Um, and then there's something that's been showing up in the literature, uh, fragmentation of ice ice particles colliding with each other. And these are the three that I'll just briefly, or these two anyway, I'll briefly mention because they have been in the literature historically and now recently. But there are other mechanisms, thermal shock, is one that um, has shown up over the years. And this is a super cool drop impacting an ice particle, and the difference in, in temperature shocks the ice. Uh, the thing is, it has to be a pretty big difference in temperature to, to really uh, do this. And this, it, most all of these have been investigated in the laboratory, um, maybe successfully, or who knows. Hard to simulate clouds in the laboratory. Uh, I think this differential has to be on the order of five degrees. Somebody can correct me after the presentation. There's the fragmentation during sublimation. Now that requires you have clouds which are subsaturated, meaning they're um, not 100% relative humidity in juxtaposition with clouds that are saturated, water type clouds. So this doesn't happen all that often, especially not in chemos, but it could happen during entrainment. Um, is one possibility. Most of this has been, has been uh, this process has been observed in the laboratory, dangling ice crystals and then watching them sublimate. And then there's this rather esoteric one, activation of ice nuclear, activation of INP in transient supersaturation. So 
if a large supercooled drop freezes, um, the surface of it will then rise up to the zero degree sea level. And of course, the ambient air is at a much colder level. So you have a difference there um, in vapor pressure, which will produce a supersaturation. Now, the theory has, this was, by the way, debated a lot back in the early 1970s and some laboratory work done. Um, but, you know, the supersaturation can be up to 10%, which is not likely in a cloud, but it could happen in some proximity to the drop. So, but, you know, being able to actually document this is not easy to do. So it's never been really very well substantiated. And one of our colleagues did a theoretical uh, calculation that showed that the, the area around the volume around the drop is so small that it, even if it activated ice nuclei particles, which I don't know how you activate a nice nuclei particle with supersaturation. Charlie will tell us that I'm here. <laughs> but, but anyway, even if you could, there's not enough of them to account for the abundance of ice crystals that are produced and observed in clouds. Okay, those are six mechanisms. Briefly now, go through um, the three of them, and then we'll talk about their relevance to uncontaminated, well, okay, relevance to SIP in uncontaminated, moderate to strong, and that's an arbitrary number there, five to, five to 20 meters a second, updraft cores, in other words, early precipitation formation, which is the focus of this project, mainly. It's not looking at supercells, it's not looking at old clouds that are decaying. It's looking at those clouds that I showed, you know, the, the cumulus clouds that are growing strong. Most of the time, their updrafts are, if not adiabatic, uh, close to it in the initial stages. Adiabatic means they haven't been mixed with anything. Now, they can be influenced by ice from previous clouds that have gotten to colder temperatures and then the ice has floated around and gotten into the, the newly growing clouds. That's why we're using the word, or I am, uncontaminated. That means they haven't, they haven't experienced or been ingested, haven't ingested ice particles from uh, older clouds. Okay, so how does Hallett Moss work there? It doesn't show up very well. Um, First of all, it's in a very narrow temperature range from the laboratory experiments. And it's slow, and you need big ice. You need grapple particles, generally, um, to interact with, uh, with ice that's already been produced. So there's a lot that's already gone on in these clouds before how it Mossop process can really take place. And so Mossop said in 1985, it takes at least 10 minutes. There's probably other indications, but I think Huh? I got another one here. Okay. Yeah, lead in to what I'm going to show next. Um, it's observed mainly in decaying regions of cumulus clouds with low liquid water contents and weak, I'm going to say in this case, plus or minus two meters per second updraft velocity. And this is um, based on work from Andy Hinesfield and Paul Willis back in the NAMA project off Cape Verde. And now I get to show their a couple of their figures put together out of the paper. And basically what we're seeing in the shaded regions here is that the large, the predominance of ice in, that are needles and column shaped, which are what the howitt Mosset process in that temperature regime is alleged to produce, um, are in a region of plus or minus two meters a second. This is about 90% here, and here it shows the, you know, where all the measurements are and, um, as a function of updraft speed, vertical velocity. And the predominance, again, is plus or minus two meters a second. So we're talking about clouds here in the, in the project and in, we're calling uh, vigorous, fresh, young, whatever, cumulus are you know, at least something in the order of five meters per second, and they go up to 20 meters a second easily. Several of them did in our project. Headbangers. Um, SIP produced by ice-ice collisions. 
gosh, there's not a lot to talk about there either. The only laboratory work was done back in the, well, previous century by Lori Vardaman and uh, Takahashi with confl conflicting results. And there's been some theoretical studies, but lately the most uh, attention it's got is from Vaughn Phillips modeling ice ice collisions. So based on the laboratory work, which is conflicting. So that's what, and the other thing is, again, you need ice that has differential fall velocities that are pretty, pretty large, meaning big ice and small ice. So you have to have, to have big ice form, and that's it's kind of late in the process of these uh, precipitation developing updrafts. Okay, so now we move on to what I call a synthesis of results from seven recent field projects. And this starts with the Ice-T project in 2011 in the Caribbean. Um, that was with the NCAR C-130 in the Learjet. It went on to Seekers and NASA Seekers in 2013. Um, southeast U.S. and over the Gulf. Two projects, it was only the Learjet. The Seekers project included the DC-8. Um, one in the U.S. and one in the U UAE. Uh, Campex, more recently, 2019, over the South China and Philippine Seas. Spicuol, and then just most recently, the ESCAPE project, another NSF project in the Houston area. So we're going to show up a, a, a in conglomeration of results, I guess you might want to call it. And here's the first conglomeration or figure that is going to be hard to um, interpret everything in it. So I'm going to point out a few things that I think are important. Uh, the red droplet size distributions, and these are all in ice-free updrafts now. Um, so all the aircraft has sampled the updraft and is, could not find ice, although it can't sample the whole updraft. So the red um, droplet size distributions produce a large amount of coalescence, millimeter-sized drops, high concentrations, up at the observation level, which varies here, but it's, you know, it's somewhere between minus 1 and minus 8, I guess, minus 9. Um, but the cloud-based temperatures are all warm plus 23, and we have one at, at uh, plus 20. Um, but that is not really strong. It's not characterized here as being strong coalescence. The strong coalescence is in the Caribbean areas, the maritime regions, and warm cloud base. That's, that's the key we're trying to point out. Now, the rest of these droplet size distributions are in areas, all of them happen to be continental, and they go from one investigation in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is a cloud base of minus 11, to, uh, let's see if I can see this, up to, um, looks like, yeah, plus 14 in Amarillo, Texas. And these colors, you know, go from dark blue to, to green, and the sort of yellow colors here, the uh, yellow and tan colors are sort of an intermediate range of, of cloud-based temperatures. So the development of coalescence, that is the development of large drops, supercooled drops in clouds, is strongly influenced by cloud-based temperature. Uh, this is not a surprise, because the warmer the cloud base, then the more distance there is between the bottom of the cloud and where it gets up to, like, the zero degree level. So there's more room in the clouds to, for the droplets to you know, hit each other and coalesce. Uh, I call it coalescence. It's actually technically collision coalescence. So we'll just keep calling it co coalescence for now. Um, so this, this is you know, a, a nice finding over a lot of geographic regions that we can see. Um, again, I'll just point out you know, the blues and greens and so forth. They don't give larger than a couple hundred uh, microns in, in drop diameter. OK. And a visual representation of this, here's the Caribbean and the Ice-T project. And then we go over to 
the uh, Philippines and Southeast U.S. and then the UAE and all the way over to the uh, High Plains. And you can just see these are images of droplets. This one's just right about a millimeter here. And as the cloud bases get cooler and cooler, you get fewer and fewer larger droplets until you get over to the High Plains, cold cloud bases, no large droplets. Now, this was pretty well documented in the ENRI project back in the 60s and 70s using not so sophisticated instrumentation, but very effective. Um, the NCAR sailplane, you used to be, have a sailplane here that the instruments on it would circle up in the updrafts. Jim Dye was the, the PI on that. And it could actually make a quasi-Lagrangian measurement in the updraft. And they documented that, you know, very rarely did they see any large droplets. And their cloud-based temperatures were not much warmer than plus seven. And I can be corrected on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what was in the report. So that's not a new finding, that the High Plains um, does not produce clouds that, that, that generate a, a vigorous or a strong coalescence process. So now we go into the secondary ice produced by fragmented frozen drops, FFD. So the observations suggest that, in, particularly in tropical marine cumulus, supercooled large drops freeze, produce fractured drops. Some of them produce spicules. And that's the name of this project. Um, if you've looked at, had the occasion to see ice cubes in a refrigerator freeze and produce these spikes that come out of them, uh, they've often been called spicules. We'll see a little bit more of that. Um, and the spicules, or the fragments from the freezing drops, will generate small ice particles, which then have a much lower fall velocity than the remaining large supercooled drops. So you get this avalanche process, whereby supercooled drops freeze, produce small ice particles. Other supercooled drops come tumbling down, hit these, freeze, and produce more small ice particles. Now, not every supercooled drop, when it freezes, produces ice particles. But you know, the laboratory experiments say something maybe by 10 to 25 percent. So here's a cartoon of what happens in a tropical marine environment. And we're looking at a cloud now that has a top of minus 5 degrees. And the blue droplet distribution is at cloud base. It goes out to almost 100 microns. Um, and usually, in the marine environment, a fairly low number concentration. Um, as Squires had postulated, less than about 200, 200 per cubic centimeter. <clears throat> and at zero degrees C, you've already got a coalescence process that's produced millimeter drops. I'm showing those to be the, the big, darker blue. And then at minus 5, Coalescence, the coalescence process has produced about an order of magnitude more of those supercooled large drops. Next, cloud, cloud gets a little colder, up to about minus 12. You get some kind of primary production of ice, some kind of nucleation um, from presumably an INP or two. And the clouds start to freeze. I and mean, that's where that avalanche process I mentioned talks about. I don't know if you can see. This is going to be a lab video that I'll show in a, in a few slides. But once, once you get this process started, where uh, some of the supercooled, large supercooled drops freeze, it produces a lot of them very rapidly. And this has been, was documented as early as 1963 <laughs> using um, foil impactors that looked at drops from the, and ice particles from hitting the foil, and then they'd take the foil after the, uh, oh, okay, I'll get, I should back up a little bit. The foil is, is on a revolving 
wheel or spindle of some type, and the airplane flies through the clouds, and the droplets hit the foil and make an impression. And they were able to carefully look at this and determine um, what, what drops were and what ice particles were and so forth. Kind of like what we do with our instruments now, but a little more crude. So then you get the avalanche process and you get rapid glaciation, which they observed, even at clouds at as warm as minus 10, but tops at minus 10. Let's see how we're doing. We're doing OK. Um, now, this is a slide that I borrowed some of this from Alexi Korolev. But other parts of it appear in a, in, in a paper that I participated in. <clears throat> so what we're showing here, OK, on the x-axis is a parameter, which we call is the temperature of cloud base, which we called a significant contributor to co coalescence. And now, as I think we're seeing, the uh, stronger coalescence is, the more likely the secondary ice process is going to be. So it's the temperature of the cloud base in kelvins times the diameter of the largest drops at cloud base in millimeters. So it's just a made-up parameter. But as it gets bigger, it means there's more uh, chance of, of producing coalescence <clears throat> and secondary ice. And over here on the y-axis is the temperature We've measured, I mean, excuse me, where we've measured <clears throat> where the adiabatic liquid water content computed from cloud base decreases to about 10% of its adiabatic value. Um, and this is, you know, measured by hot wires, basically, and imaging probes and so forth. It's not an exact measurement, but it's, it's pretty good. Now, it can also be affected by entrainment, not just by uh, conversion of of liquid to ice. But we get this curve that shows up where in the regions with cold cloud bases, um, and there's no coalescence and no SIP, as we've seen in some of the measurements. And over here in the warm cloud bases, particularly in the mar tropical maritime regions, um, a lot of coalescence and a lot of SIP. And in between, you know, maybe some coalescence, maybe not a lot. So what it looks like, in terms of Alexi's drawing here, is this is just primary nucleation, no SIP. So we got a lot of small cloud droplets here. And as the cloud gets taller and taller, the small cloud droplets keep going up to a temperature where primary nucleation um, can occur because there are enough INP that are active at the colder temperatures. And INP, you know, in increase in their activity about an order of magnitude for each four degrees, something like that. So, you know, four degrees means a big difference. So now you start seeing ice particles freezing, and as they freeze, they rhyme, and they start to fall. And so they have their own sort of process here that's going to um, create some create precipitation eventually at colder temperatures than the temperatures I have shown in the Caribbean. And eventually, some of this is transported up into the what we like to call the anvil or the blow-off of the top of the clouds. So the bottom line here is, let me show the other example. Bottom line is that uh, a lot of the moisture, a lot of the uh, liquid water that either is transported or, or eventually freezes is blown up high into the atmosphere, higher in the atmosphere than when we have this secondary ice process. And there's a process whereby rain is produced at what's warmer, warmer temperatures. And presumably, you'll get a lot more rain when this happens. Um, that's certainly what maybe some of the models are starting to show now. All right, this is a video in a laboratory and reported by Wildman. Wild man, in 2017, that's a millimeter drop on a uh, hydrophobic surface, very hydrophobic surface, and it's at a very low atmospheric pressure, which is probably not realistic of 
where this drop would, would necessarily be in a real cloud, but this is the way they did it. So a, uh, I have to use the mouse now. So there was another drop here that fell apart and went out of the depth of field of this camera. And this is high speed video, very, very high speed. So we're gonna watch this, try, as this drop produces a spicule. It's rolling from the force. There comes the spicule, as promised. Okay, now we, we try to fast forward a little bit here. And you're gonna see, whoops. Okay, that's enough. You're gonna see particles coming, shooting out of it. There they are, right there. I guess we could go back just a little bit and watch it again. There's a lot happening, there's the particles. There's a lot happening on the surface of this drop. Um, and it continues to happen. We'll go fast forward again through here. A lot of cracking and various functions. Until in this example, It breaks up pretty violently. Wait for it. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so how realistic is this? It's hard to say. Um, but it, it does happen. OK, the next video is from Thomas Leisner's lab in, in Oh, up, up here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's a couple seconds over this whole time. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, this happens pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's a thousand frames per second or something or other, it's a lot. This other one is out of Leisner's lab in, in uh, Karlsruhe, Germany. And what they did was they suspended drops um, electromagnetically, so they, were, they weren't on a surface. They were actually floating um, in the air. But, you know, this also, you don't see these kind of electric fields in, in clouds, well, not, not localized like this around drops. So it's not maybe totally realistic, but this is gonna happen much more quickly. And you're gonna see a, a jet, what they're calling a jet of, of stuff. <laughs> they haven't determined whether it's water or ice or both yet. So let's see how that goes. Okay, look for the jet. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something that interesting. It's called recalcitrance. Um, this is when the ice in the drop freezes. It, it produces a mixture of ice and water until the, the, the temperature of the water actually gets up to zero uh, degrees C. I'm going to just show that again. Not only is there a jet, but there's some particles coming out at the end of the jet, too, or what look like they might be particles. There. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I get a kick out of it. All right, and there's the papers that those came from. And oh, I guess I'll just mention they, they in Leisner's, they, they documented all these different processes breakup, cracking, jetting surface bubble burst and specular bubble bursts. And that was a 300 micron drop. The one from Wildman's laboratory that you, show, that you saw break up was a millimeter drop. Okay, so this is now another slide from one of Alexi's papers, actually. And he's just showing how many of these fragments you see from CPI images um, when airplanes fly through clouds. You see lots of fragments of drops that have frozen after they broke, or frozen and, and broken up. Um, what's he called? 
yeah, freezing fracturing process. These are drops that are producing little nodules. It could be spicules. And these are drops after they've frozen, are now showing um, some crystalline structure, monocrystalline structure on, on the drops. And, you know, there's a lot of examples. Okay, how am I doing? I'm doing okay. The, the next slide is, is from Spicule. Glad we finally got there. And this is, this is a busy slide as well. Um, this is a time series going across the bottom of uh, penetrations of clouds. And this is the altitude of the Learjet and temperatures as it's climbing, hitting cloud tops, and photographs of where it goes through the various cloud tops. Uh, this radar view is, a, is an up and down looking K-band radar. And what's nice is to see what we interpret as a development of coalescence when you look at the red and yellow returns here in the radar. Um, and as you look at those, you look down at the, at the drops that the Learjet is uh, sampling as it's flying through. And these are what we call 2DS images with 10 micron resolution. And down here are 50 micron resolution. So a lot of these looking smaller drops are actually bigger than the ones above. And finally, the, the CPI, which only has a very small field of view and 2.3 micron resolution. So in other words, this is a millimeter drop here. Um, what do we got here? Millimeter is about that size, something like that. And this is a couple hundred microns. So that's sort of the difference here. And again, you see the, um, frac the uh, fragmented frozen drops um, in, the, uh, in the images. So when we get to minus 14, that's various temperatures, minus 10, minus 14, we see you know, the first appearance of ice. Doesn't mean it was the first ice. It was the first ice the aircraft saw. Um, there can be a, all kinds of other ice that formed slightly earlier or, or whatever, or it just formed in a different location in the cloud. This is the, the challenge with uh, using aircraft measurements, especially without radar. Um, we have these little pencil lines that lasers make, and, and we, that, that's our sample volume as we fly through. But the lasers, excuse me, the radar um, shows not only development of coalescence, but also what looks apparently to be the uh, rainout of uh, hydrometeors, raindrops, and, and grapple, probably in this case, and corresponding with some of the images. Finally, at the coldest temperature on this penetration, I think minus 17 and a half or so, you get to see even. Um, crystalline growth, diffusional growth of, of, of new ice that has been formed from small drops that have frozen earlier, and then uh, and they've grown in crystalline structures. And this is showing over on the right, the blue is the water droplet distribution measured by the aircraft, at minus, this case, minus 14. And the red is the ice. You can see in this case, we, we looks like most of the uh, ice that had frozen were in larger sizes, and a few out to hundreds of microns. Occasionally, we see many smaller ones. And then it just progresses with more and more ice as we get colder. OK, I think that's about all I wanted to show on that. But you know, with the radar, it's a wing-mounted radar. It's not you know, real high sensitivity. It's not a super-duper radar made by ProSensing. Um, but, boy, it, it gives us a, the picture we didn't have before, just flying through the clouds without the up-down looking radar. You, can, you know, it's, it's up-down, so you can see where cloud top is, too, in these measurements. We're just right below cloud top. Okay, shift gears a little bit. I wanted to throw in a little bit of Paul Dumas' work, and this is from a, his graduate student, um, Ryan Patnude. Um, I might have to be corrected on the pronunciation. And what he's showing here is primary nucleation. He's calling it primary nucleation at, at minus 17C. 
This is now in a cloud that had a very high uh, CCN concentration measured by the G5 below cloud base, up to about 1,100 per cubic centimeter. And he's showing this as, again, the water droplet distribution at minus 17 and, and a little bit of ice that he, and, and a nice stellar at minus 17, the, the little fragment. And here's where it ends up on the ice, um, ice nucleating particle, INP, curves that they generate from their instrumentation. So this is, the blue is, a, is one pass in the area, and, and, and the red is another pass by the G5 subcloud pass measuring ice nuclei particles. Uh, and so it's close, you know? so you claim victory. And it's an example also, though, of a cloud that had a, well, the previous cloud I, uh, clouds I showed with the Learjet and the radar had a cloud-based temperature of plus 17 and a half. This one was plus 17, so they're pretty similar in cloud-based temperature. Um, and one of them produced some millimeter drops, not a high concentration, but some. And this one, you know, didn't produce any at that temperature. But the difference is, and this is hard to kind of quantify, is this had about twice the concentration of CCN at cloud base, and um, substantiated by measurements of the droplet distribution. Uh, so they will be doing more work of this nature. This next is an example of Learjet measurements just in the same format as the last one, but now it is a different day, but again, measurements at a cloud-based temperature, in this case, hmm, I didn't put it on there. I think it was actually a little bit warmer. It was right minus 18 or minus 19, excuse me, plus 18 or plus 19. But again, we have this example where there's no coalescence being formed up here, and it was uh, another case when it, the CCN concentration, the aerosol concentration, what we're calling polluted clouds, basically, um, was, it was much higher. So, you know, the aerosol concentration definitely can, if it's high, can inhibit the formation of coalescence in clouds where it has or this sort of intermediate cloud-based temperature. Now, uh, in the uh, CAMPEX project, in the South China Sea and the Philippine Sea, we had pretty polluted areas. You know, we had clouds that were, you know, had six or maybe up to 800 um, per cc at droplet distribution at cloud base, but they still formed coalescence because they had plus 23 cloud base temperatures. So they, were, they had a lot more cloud to work with there. Um, so this is the same sort of thing, cloud climbing up near cloud top and all water drops that we could find, except for three mysterious particles that looked like they were probably ice. Bob, let me get back to offset. So if you could plot these in windows, then we show another time period. You want me to go back to the other time period? No, no, just in this sequence. Yeah. You want to know what the time, can you read the time periods below? Yeah, 32, 40, then 32, 26. Is there something you are kind of putting it differently? Or? I'm not quite getting it. Uh, 2226 to 2227? Yeah, before that, you are talking to the Yeah, that's a mistake. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It was measured later. Okay. Yeah, no, no, it is not a mistake. Yeah, these are, these are put together in terms of, of temperature. Thanks for pointing that out. But it was measured afterwards. You know, a different cloud, different turret, yeah, which is something we've got to recognize here. We're not, we're not always able to measure the, the exact same turret on all these measurements. Okay, I only have a couple slides left, so I think I'm close to being, well, I'm over. Okay, there, there's been a predictor of, uh, of coalescence in clouds using effective, cl effective drop radius. And, and we see this in the, uh, in the measurements. For example, the plus 10 cloud base of the UAE and relatively high aerosol concentrations, CCN, just barely got to this um, region of uh, 10 to 12, or 12 to 14, excuse me, 12 to 14 microns as being an indicator of an active coalescence process. And this is based on 
both observations and models. And in the southeast U.S., you know, it got there earlier, but it was a cloud base of plus 20. And then these are the South China Sea, Philippine Sea, and Caribbean measurements of plus 23. And they're at that uh, 12 to 14 micron effective radius value, very low and very warm in the cloud. So they're producing coalescence like crazy. And it's, it turns out it probably is a pretty good predictor. And then we get to Hugh's work, Hugh Morrison, who modeled that UAE cloud that had a approximately plus 10 cloud base. And I just want to show here, OK, this is the cloud, cloud base measurements, are the red, actual measurements of droplet distribution at cloud base. The uh, green is what the simulation produced using an aerosol distribution below cloud base uh, for droplet. Pretty good agreement. And then you reduce the concentration of aerosols by a factor of 10 from 612 down to about 61. And he ends up with the black curve here, which is a much lower concentration of the small drops. And for comparison, we've thrown in a typical Caribbean in the cyan color which looks more like you know, um, what we'd expect for a coalescence. And then, now quickly we go up to the observation level, which happens to be minus 12 in this case. And we have the, the same color scheme here. Actual measurements are the red. The green is the simulation, which represents it pretty well. And then if we, when he reduced the uh, cloud base aerosol concent sub cloud base aerosol concentration, he gets a much larger development of coalescence drops, of larger drops. And blue, the cyan is just thrown in for reference. That's what the Caribbean would look like. So the idea here is if you can reduce the, the polluted regions below cloud, you know, you might be able to stimulate them to produce more rain. OK. My summary is my summary, and um, you can read it online. I think it's gone far enough, and I will take any questions. And I thank you. I appreciate everybody coming today. You know, kind of, kind of a nasty weather, but I, I one more comment. We're 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 near the forecasting group here, aren't we? Don't, don't, don't the forecasters belong to e, some of them to EOL and modelers to M cubed? And, well, I see that they're forecasting between three inches and three feet of snow. <laughs> yes, but not instantaneously over a period of time. <laughs> With that, I'd really like to thank our speaker, Dr. Paul Lawson, for giving a really great interview on secondary ice. Um, ice uh, formation, and it was really nice to see how the spicule measurements fit within that process. We do have time for a few questions, both online and in person. Does anyone have any questions for Paul? Um, very, very interesting talk. Um, the airplane, when you fly the airplane, just the turbulence created doesn't affect the process of measurement. You understand, mask? <laughs> You know what has been documented to affect is the actual creation of ice particles. I didn't go into that, but um, aircraft produced ice particles is something that's been investigated quite a bit, uh, just from you know maybe various processes, but cooling the air as propellers go around or air flows around an airplane. But it doesn't really affect the turbulence that much. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it has been known to, to produce ice particles. But mo not with jet airplanes, interestingly. Mostly with like airplanes like the C-130 that have big propellers that turn pretty rapidly. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, um, so I know the focus is on uh, FFD, though. Uh, uh, earlier on, you were talking about ice-ice collision and how it's unfavorable for uh, coalescence because you would have to have some sort of differential updraft or fall speed. But 
does that mean then sheared environments for horizontal ice ice collision is unfavorable as well, or is that something that hasn't been taken into account? I don't know if it's been taken into account. Um, do you mean shared environments in cumulus, or do you mean shared environments like in frontal clouds? I guess in either scenario where um, you might have some differential um, horizontal wind that... Um, yeah, in a, in a cumulus updraft, you, you, tip, you typically don't. You know, you don't have that type of shear until you get up really higher in the cloud where, the, where you sure. see the blow-off stuff. Sure. So I don't think it's taking place in, in that updraft. It, so not even in the uh, in training edges where you might yeah, actually have sure. more? Yeah, sure. The in training edges is what we're kind of avoiding here. Okay. You know, and the, thanks for pointing that out or mentioning it. Yeah, th those are, you know, you can have, it almost always do have downdrafts on the outside of the updrafts in these clouds. If the cloud topper is high enough, you can bring down ice particles and they can get mixed in to the, uh, you know, to the, more adiabatic ice, ice, and yeah, those edges are hard, hard to deal with. When I was flying the NCAR sailplane in this project in 1981, spiraling up, cope. What I noticed is just how calm and how quiescent it was in the updraft. But you, I could tell when I was getting out of it because I'd start to hit a little turbulence, you know, at the edges. So that, that's, a, that's a way of, then you focus back toward the other direction. But um, yeah, there's not much happening in a, in a really unmixed updraft. Thank you. Vivek? Yeah, uh, this regarding the remote measurement. Uh, it's the first time you collected with the KA band yeah. under W band. So I'm wondering, um, is that, would you had a chance to cut together, like some other time, coincident measurements like that? And is that data exist somewhere? How does that, just want yeah. to comment on that? Actually, we've done a little bit of that, but not enough. Okay. The person who's done probably more of it is, is Alexei Karloff, because okay. he supplied the KA band and did the radar processing, and he's very interested in comparing it, you know, with the W band measurements. Although, as you know, boy, they, they, they're different wavelengths, and they see different types of particles. But yeah, that's that's. It'd be nice if there was a graduate student or somebody that wanted to do that. <laughs> because uh, the W band has a lot more a better sensitivity than a, a KA band. Oh, in this case, much better. Yeah, yeah, much better in this case yeah. with, with that particular radar. That's right. So yeah. it'll see cloud drops, and yeah. the KA band will not. Not that's I mean right. by cloud drops, I mean less than fifty microns or that's so. That's right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks. And we have a question from one of the Spicule PIs. Can uh, secondary ice production be ruled out in stratiform cloud? No. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not talking about stratiform clouds. They're boring. No. <laughs> no, actually, in the Arctic, as, as you know, there's, there's um, drizzle, drizzle formed in those clouds. And there's been at least radar measurements that have shown are indicated that there are secondary ice production there. And we have another question. Hi, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering about the horizontal legs beneath the clouds, and had you looked at all at the aerosol fluxes into the bottom of the clouds in terms of what's actually uh, imparting itself into the cloud rather than that? You know, just the concentration in the boundary layer is not necessarily speaking to what's moving upward. That's way above my pay grade. <laughs> no, I, I, we haven't. You know, the group that I've been working with hasn't. Um, it, it, it would be nice if somebody did. Yeah. Are those horizontal legs long enough to do so? That's all I was really wondering. They're very long, yeah. They were typically, you know, 60 kilometers, 100 kilometers. Now, when, when, the, air, when the Gulf Stream got under the cloud, you know, then it made quick turns back and forth. But the legs back and forth before that, you know, were, were long. We have a question. Thanks, Paul. Very nice. Uh, thanks for giving a plug to sailplane. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things we found with the sailplane, and you're right, when you're going up in this undiluted turret, 
you get, you know, very narrow drop of spectrum, and you get some ice forming when you get up to minus 12, minus 15, there about, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. But then, as you mentioned, on the dandruffs, yeah. that's carried down. And so there are times where we are making a couple of ascents in the cloud, one that was more or less undiluted, another that we have mixed down. And so we get some of these few grapple particles that get down below the melting zone, melt, and get carried back up. Yep. So, in fact, with the sailplane, we actually saw broken drops with spicules with the particle camera. But my question really is, to what extent do you think the secondary ice production that you're talking about actually contributes to total precipitation formation because of this recycling? Well, I, I think, you know, I'll just say I think, that the primary precipitation mechanism in high plains clouds, if you will, is recirculation. I don't, you don't get much precipitation if you have clouds that are, you know, tops of minus 15, minus 20. Yeah. You, you get very little, and most of it's Virgo. We flew through some of it yesterday. Um, when, you, when you get clouds that are going up to much colder and they're, you know, bunched up together and you get recirculation, that's where the real precipitation, you know, forms. And when you have that, you can have, you know, a huge amount of precip. <laughs> so I guess, yeah. Great. Well, those are wonderful discussions. Any questions? Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> you just looked eager. But <laughs> do, you have an, do you have an answer? <laughs> a comment? Okay. <laughs> Um, well, we're kind of a little past our seminar hour. Uh -oh. um, if you're interested Three in, minutes. if you're interested in um, um, any of the research that um, Paul has shown, or if you're a graduate student interested in working on this, um, Spec Inc is local to Boulder, and I'm sure you can get in touch with Paul. His email address is um, on the advertisement. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Okay, thank you.